Well, if there's a bright center to the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. Welcome to the Outer Rim. Enjoy your stay. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun, and we're back talking comic books. More specifically, we are returning to talking about my X-Men collection. This is episode number two of that, but like episode number 20 or 21 of the actual comic book series that we're doing. Uh, and this is a lot of fun. I, I really am happy that I'm doing this and looking back at this because a lot of these books, man, I'm reading for the first time, the really old ones, because I went on a collection spree back when I was, when, after Neil Adams passed and just decided to get as many of the old X-Men books as I could at the time. And I got as far as 54 <laughs> and that's it. And then uh, after that, we've got like most of the Claremont run. And probably as we do the series, we'll be filling in the gaps uh, before we even get to those issues that I don't have. Um, but I just am really happy to finally just talk about the X-Men in some kind of chronological order on the channel as best as I can. And going over panel by panel what I love about these books. Um, and last issue that we talked about, the first episode of this, we were doing X-Men number 54, the first appearance of Alex Summers, who will become Havoc. We have the first appearance of the Living Pharaoh. We've got the Living Monolith. We've got a, a back-end story <clears throat> that is the retelling of the origin of Angel. Uh, we've got some pretty good art. But this one is also special because it's the first Neil Adams X-Men book. And over the course of the issues that he does here. And it's not a ton. Some people don't have long arcs, you know, on their, on their books. Like, uh, you know, like how famous he is for doing Batman. And I think that for a while, um, and things have gotten, there's definitely been an upswing and, and, and amongst people who know, you know, Neil Adams has never not been a big thing, but for your lay comic book reader and your person who doesn't read comics at all, reader they don't know neil adams from you know anybody else that you could say they might recognize one name out there and i couldn't even tell you who that would be right now uh like what comic what comic book artist other than todd mcfarlane is would be the closest to a household name really you know there's a, and don't get me wrong there's a ton of artists that everybody should should know but i'm talking about your your person who doesn't read comics What's the comic book artist that people who don't read comics know? I would still have to say probably still Todd McFarlane. I mean, you could say Stan Lee and they'd be right. And maybe Kirby. I don't know. I'm getting off track here talking about the art and the artists. But we're here talking about Neil Adams' first one. The big monolith on the cover of the, of the book. And, you know, later on, you know, we, we would have the Dark Phoenix uh, cover that kind of looks a little bit like that, a little similar. But as we were going on, I wanted to talk, though, about, because I was kind of like, like, what the hell is the Living Pharaoh anyway? So last issue, if you haven't watched it, we find ourselves like the X-Men are meeting Alex Summers for the first time. He's graduating and like he's hid that this like even the guy doesn't know that Cyclops is his brother, but they're all interested in his life for some reason, you know. And at the beginning, it's like this mystery of Cyclops waking up next to a dead body and the cops are there. <laughs> like these are definitely different kind of X-Men stories, right? It's from the 1960s, so almost 1970, but the cops are there and Cyclops wakes up and he's like, you're under arrest for murder of killing this living Pharaoh guy that we found here. 
And so they spend the rest of the issue retelling how Cyclops got there. Now, I like that the story is told like that. I really do. I like the whole, like, you know, it's one of the early versions of the of a TV show that starts at the end and then says two days earlier, right? They did that in this, and it's 1969. So that's how far back, at least from my knowledge, that they've done this in comics anyway. And so we get to find out that, like, it was all, like, it all plays out. They, they, they attack, like, okay, I love how they attacked in that, like, how many B movies from the 60s were there about where, where you would find there would be a, 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 a section of that film where <clears throat> some kind of cult, religious or otherwise, religious, um, that would come and kidnap somebody for a ritual back in those days. And this is no different. Like, it's almost like, like a B movie plot. It is a B movie plot in this with the X Men involved, and then you you know you throw in the living Pharaoh and stuff like that. This is total B movie stuff. But I wanted to at least explain the living Pharaoh a little bit more, so that, you know we get a more context of what his character is at least, even if the situation is very B movie. All right, so I'm getting this from Marvel fandom that the character's name is Ahmet Abdul. That is the living Pharaoh's real name. And he was a professor of professor, a professor of ancient Egyptology when he formed a theory that the gods and pharaohs of old were actually ancient mutants. Accused of heresy when he announced his findings, Abdul was attacked by a mob who chased him through the streets with his wife and infant daughter. Abdul wrecked his car and his wife died in the burning vehicle as the mob looked on and did nothing to help him save her. So he discovered, as one does, and maybe it was the accident that brought it out of him. I'm not sure. But Abdul discovered he had the ability to manipulate cosmic energy mainly by observing it and projecting it as energy blasts. Reflectives, reflexively firing upon the crowd as his mutant ability manifested. So yeah, a man approached Abdul in the streets claiming to represent the cult of the living Pharaoh. The cult believed Abdul's research and saw him as a living God reborn. The man offered Abdul the services of the cult and Ahmet Abdul became the living Pharaoh. So basically, <laughs> in order to do like his research on stuff... He, he becomes the leader of a cult. Now he has like a bunch of protection and shit to like back up his like nuttiness. Abdul's patron was actually the immortal mutant Apocalypse. He considered Abdul to be broken, beaten man of great potential, but without direction. Apocalypse acquired a sample of Alex Summers' DNA, who would one day become the X-Men known as Havoc, ensuring that its coding had been modified for his purposes and had Mr. S sinister grafted to abdul see this is stuff that we're not seeing in this book though <laughs> the experiment was only partially successful and resulted in an unexpected and quite unusual symbiotic relationship wherein abdul's power was split between them and not shared because alex summers was young at the time and had not actively manifested his powers the living pharaoh received the majority of their power at first Deciding to use his powers for his own personal gain, Abdul created a cult around himself and set about his plan to rule the world. Huh. Years later, Abdul discovered that Alex Summers could absorb and project cosmic energy more easily than Abdul could. See, and we haven't, like, and we're, like, looking at it like, why is Havoc not being Havoc? It's because he's not Havoc yet. And he doesn't understand, or even the book hasn't really explained his powers. They're trying to. I mean, I do like that they explained back then him talking about him absorbing cosmic energy. Um, but he abused him to increase his power. Abdul find a way to screen Summer's body from ambient cosmic radiation, permitting his own body to attain its latent potential. Abdul was transformed into the living monolith, a gigantic mutant with vast cosmic power. The monolith was defeated while in combat with the X-Men when Alex's latent mutant powers surfaced under the stress of entombment within the mechanism designed to screen him from the cosmic radiation. Abdul was captured by the Sentinels, but escaped when the X-Men freed all the captives. Okay, so this is like 
going into way more about this than is in the issues I believe that we're talking about right now today. But that is a big chunk of the living Pharaoh and, and stuff that's in, not in this. All right. They're not bringing up apocalypse and Mr. Sinister in this because apocalypse and Mr. Sinister weren't around for a good long time. And it, I think it was probably just ways for to show those characters messing around in the original X-Men's past. And then, so speaking of X-Men's past, it's about time that we went backwards and read and looked at panel to panel issue number 56, Neil Adams's first X-Men. Okay, like I said, great cover. X-Men. He's like grabbing the X-Men logo in a way. Number 56 from May of 1969, which would probably put it around July or maybe that when they posted it. If this is May, it was probably like April or March. What is the power? Make sure we get it on that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this. Okay, because when it pops back out, you see like all the Egyptian stuff with like the, the just nice pencils with the uh, retro-looking future car, you know, ship they're flying, and just their costumes in general and the detail of it. I love it. The musculature and everything that's put here. <clears throat> Archaeological diggings below crew, as if you couldn't tell, an excavation, to be more precise. Good. Maybe there'll be someone there to whom we can turn over our stony-faced captive. X-Men, the most unusual fighting team of all time in What is the Power? And again, just look at that. Like They're shooting in over the like white of the desert, but just with all that detail. And again, it looks to me like it's like Straight out of like the temple from the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. This five star feature by Stan Lee, editor Roy Thomas, scripter Tom Palmer, inker Herb Cooper, letterer, and introducing the penciling wizardry of Neil Adams. <sighs> Neil! You have eyes, infidel, but cannot see. Only the desert winds hold court in this place. Not a creature is stirring, not even a sphinx. I'll hold our prisoner while we do the footwork, or in my case, the wing work. Marvel Girl, see what you can scout up behind those dunes. And me, Cyclops, what about Alex Summers, the all-American shock treatment, the walking earthquake, who can't even shake hands or fear he'll kill somebody? <laughs> what about me, Rob Stone? <laughs> Easy, Alex. We'll figure out that mutant power of yours and... Power? What do any of you know about Power? The living pharaoh alone knows the true secret of the ability you both possess, just as he knows that you are in truth brothers. A little fact he picked up last ish, Stan. But fear not, young fools. You shall learn that secret from my lips in the hour that you die. The Gary is a ghost town, psych. Still, to cop a cliche, it's too quiet. Angel, all of you, duck! The tomb. They were inside the tomb. Kazak. Love it. That is the end of them. Only the great Pharaoh himself could survive our concussion guns. Fool. The mutants are but stunned. Look, even now one of them raises his head. Now, I mean, just straight up. This is like straight out of like Commander Cody like the serials from like that they would show on mystery science theater. And again, guys that would come in and like get the guy for our master and bring him back to the temple. Just this story was everywhere back then, which is more than you'll be able to do friend. Cause this is the part where I bring down the house on you. 
Katunk. I think not, infidel. <laughs> he really hit him. Look at this. Dang, man, he hit him hard with that thing. Violence may well be the last refuge of the incompetent son. What? But if Cyclops has sustained injuries, even the mild-mannered beast may be forced into physical retaliation. Ah, be not dismayed, O Pharaoh. We are more than enough to defeat that brute. You desert swine, do not waste your time battling the masked ones. Only Alex Summers concerns the living Pharaoh. Then he's still after Alex, even now. But why? What possible connection can there be? Observe, son of Osiris. A single blast fells the bestial one. Hurry, dogs. Let not our departure be as slow as your rescue. We must go before the unbelievers awaken. If that's what you're hoping for, you just got busted out. Because all your powers went up in smoke with your scrummy, crummy scepter. And here's where the Iceman makes you holler, Uncle! <laughs> Uncle, get it? Oh, boy. Ha! You think I'm yet powerless, eh? Then explain this to your mutant friend, Stripling. Yeesh! He zapped my icy battering ram like so much cotton candy. It's not your fault. He's getting away, Bobby. This was the angel's prize foul up. Should have spotted those jokers instead of playing glory hog, but I'll make up for it. Look, great pharaoh, the winged one follows us even as we gain altitude. Uh-oh, one of the guru's goon boys has spotted me. And I'm still groggy as a gas gosling, which means I'll be sitting duck if they... Fire concussion missiles! Boom, boom, boom. My son, the superhero. They knocked me right out of the sky. And the ball game. Be lucky if I can save my own feathered fern. While in the de deepening shadows below, Jean... Jean! She took the full brunt of the first blast. If she's hurt, they'll pay. They'll pay. <laughs> no, she's coming too. Jean, speak to me. Feel weak. So very weak. She appears to be basically intact, Scotty. But where's our pinion and compere? If you mean Angel, he went that away. But that's the last I saw before I blacked out. Jean, I know you're still stunned, confused. Yet if only you could locate Warren mentally. I, I'll try, Scott. What a gal. There's nobody like her. <laughs> and I do like, I love this. I love this. And the reserve, the sheer stark understatement of Bobby Drake's random thought is dynamically demonstrated a fleeting instant later. As Jean Grey begins a series of cerebral exertions, impossible even to describe on the printed page, until suddenly, I've established contact. Great way of like showing her like reaching out with her mind. Good old Jeannie. I knew you'd locate me sooner or later. I almost got creamed myself back there, but I managed to pull out of a dive. And I've been following our felon in friends near ground level so that, no, it can't be. But it is. Another temple, identical to the first, yet miles from the other site. The pharaoh's ship zoomed right through some kind of entrance. And the angel dared to follow. Jean Gal, I've got a hunch I'm getting near the nitty gritty of this little mystery. I'm breaking contact now for full concentration. You're on your own, and so am I. Listen, Angel, and listen well, as sinister words swirl like harsh winds through age-old corridors. You gaze up in sudden, sullen silence, Alex Summers. It is good, and how fitting that you should meet your rightful end here, amidst the rediscovered glory of the kings who were and those who yet shall be but I speak of things which concern you not. For I decreed you should learn of the power in the hour you perish. And that moment draws ever nearer. 
Shall buy it. I was an archaeologist, but I am also a mutant. Yet you and I are both different from the masked ones, for our destinies are inextricably linked. Can you not feel them, infidel? The celestial chains which bind our two fates is one. The same mutant instinct which led me to you tells me that it is cosmic rays which give us each the power. As yours began to awaken, mine did wane. You are the sole threat to my supremacy. And so... You must die. It is done. The chamber absorbs all cosmic rays. No longer do I share their potency. Who is one who is unworthy? Now I alone am the power. I've seen enough. Something tells me the, the X-Men. Get back, playmates, before it's too late. It's Warren, streaking out of the Holy of Holies. <laughs> but what kind of danger is he warning us against? <laughs> and then, bursting through earth and massive stone as through shedding the fabric of time itself. Zoom! The Pharaoh, he's become a giant! Good Lord, fly higher, man, higher! Grab me before I could veer away, crushing me like a helpless canary. Yes, I was indeed the he who called the Pharaoh, but now I am much, much more. Now I am he who shall restore the glory that was. Now I am the living monolith. Now am I... Ah! <laughs> Flap those wings, flyboy. His skin is like rock now, or maybe more like a tank's armor. My optic blast surprised him, not hurt him. Rejoice in the futility of a moment's respite. You shall know no more. His mutant powers have all returned, and I fell, dodging that burst. Give thanks, masked one, for as you are ground beneath my heel of stone... You shall be the first victim of the living monolith. <laughs> what? Some invisible barrier bars my way. Yes, my mental powers, but the strain, so great. Uh-oh, my tender tootsies will ache for a fortnight right, right about now. Jolton Genie definitely classifies as a damsel in distress, so whack. He freaking hits his legs against it. Your intentions are more laudable than your judgment, fool. For you have brought the girl within my grasp. My powers couldn't support his falling bulk. No, no. That phony pharaoh spotted a lot of hot air about this chamber cutting off cosmic rays. Still don't just don't know just what in blazes he meant but it sure puts a crimp in the old oxygen supply. In fact, another few breaths, and it might get downright unpleasant in this fishbowl. And yet, what if we really do share some kind of power? A power I soak up just by standing around? Something sure zapped the pharaoh a few hours ago. What if some of that something remains? It came out before in a moment of stress. And I'm starting to feel that way again. But what happened? What'll happen this time? What? I do really love that too, man. Just showing like the explosive energy in his eyes. Fools to pit your puny might against the secrets of the ages. Against him who is heir to Ramses, who is himself Horus and Osiris. My fault. He's got Gene got to no Hank look who shall restore the dynasties who his voice he's just going on isn't he his voice his grip both are getting weaker but why when he was on the verge of victory what is happening to me got you lady but the monolith is getting smaller 
and behind him, the temple, it's shaking, starting to crumble. The pharaoh became normal sized and collapsed. But so has the temple. And Alex is in there. Alex, my brother. Easy, Scotty. You can't help him now. Nothing can. You're right, Hank. All our mutant powers can't raise the dead. Perhaps he wasn't inside, Scott. Perhaps. Wait. There, in the smoking debris. It's Alex. And he's alive. No. Keep back, all of you. Don't come near me. It's true what the pharaoh said. I've got the power. And... I can't control it. Next time, disaster. So yeah, he's about to blast off in, into full-blown havoc. Except I don't think he's getting the costume yet. Professor X to Cyclops and Iceman. Although you traced down the mutant named Warren Worthington only to ask him to join the X-Men, now you must capture him at all costs because he is... The Flying A-Bomb. <laughs> and again, they're going with more of the snowy-looking Iceman. Oops. You heard the Professor Iceman. Take him. Us? Take him? I don't know what your character's game is, and I have never heard of any group called the X-Men, but you're going to learn that nobody takes the Avengel Angel where he doesn't want to go. Nobody. Dun, dun, dun. The high flying angel wings his wins his wings in this cataclysmic conclusion by Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Werner Roth, and Sam Granger. Hold it, son. We're mutants, just like you. We're friends, not enemies. Like I said, the avenging angel is strictly a loner. And now, Scotty's holding back to avoid hurting the guy with his optic blast. That leaves him wide open for the old one-two. Unless, yow, where'd that wall of ice come from? Same place you got your wings, bird boy. What say you cool it now? Cool it now. So it was you, the one who looks like a juvenile snowman. Well, I don't mind getting my fist chilly for a second in order to polish you off. Yeah, fisticuffs, man. Now he's gone too far, menacing Bobby. Still, Professor Xavier says to handle him with kid gloves, so... The skylight falling in on me. What kind of jokers am I up against? We might ask the same of you, Feathers. And below, a bewildered couple might ask the self-same question of all three as... Fred? What on earth? It's that kid you rented the loft to, Alma. Must be throwing a party in the middle of the night. Teenagers! They're all alike. I love this, right? Just throwing in, like, this is so 1960s. Like, <laughs> that's great. Bobby, you're the closest. Grab the vial in his belt. Don't know why you want that vial, sir, but will do. And I don't know who in blazes you're talking to, kid. But you definitely won't do. Swack. While some miles away in a secluded Westchester County mansion, lost contact with Bobby Drake. That means he's unconscious. And it may be impossible for Cyclops to subdue that young mutant without accidentally harming him. Then it's up to me. Must get through to him. I must. Hear me, winged mutant, and heed my words. Huh? What kind of trick? No trick, hothead. Listen to the voice. <laughs> yes, listen, for there is little time. We are your friends, fellow mutants. Something about your voice that makes me believe you. But why is time so short? Because the vial you retrieved last night from Thieves contains a new untried nuclear explosive activated by your mutant body. I discovered that while mentally probing your person. <laughs> Even we didn't know that. It does feel strange. 
if there's even a chance that voice is telling the truth. I've got to get out of here. Take it where it can't harm anybody when it blows. Good lad. If you dare, take it high, high into the night sky. For I can sense that only freezing cold can now deactivate it in time. I can sense. <laughs> Good gravy. If that wasn't a flying man, I'm ready for a senior citizen city. Make room for one more, Tom. I saw it too. <laughs> two times now. Two times they have had the, what is the average person doing in this scenario, but written like a bad sitcom. What a hot-tempered fool I was. If I hadn't slugged that Iceman guy, he could have handled the vial. But when he fell, he turned back into a normal Joe. And now it's up to me. And I'm no longer Mr. Confidence of 1963. It's getting cold up here. So cold, which is just what I want, if I can survive it. Okay, little man who isn't there. I'm so high, even my thoughts are shivering. What do I do to do now? Snap off the top of the capsule, son. <laughs> Take it down. That's the best way to get the drugs in the system. If I'm correct, that will deactivate it. And if it doesn't, scratch one angel, huh? Well, here goes nothing. It worked. Then, as the stark tension of the moment fades, so does the young mutant's consciousness. Blacking out. Can't stay awake. So cold. You must stay awake, lad. No matter what, don't close your eyes for a moment. Trying not to, I... I did it! I saved the city I endangered. And then the voice saved me. Now to find out what's going on. And soon, when a relatively humble Warren at last faces the owner of the disembodied voice... It was the gas you used to fight crime that must have hyped up your ego, son. <laughs> if you agree to join the X-Men, you'll have to discard such gimmickry. <laughs> Still, I hope you will become one of us. One of us. Since you can read minds, Professor Xavier, you, Xavier, you already know my answer. With or without gas, he's still got an ego. Who cares as long as he doesn't molt? Da -da 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 -da. The end! Next issue, 57, The Sentinels Live. Bum, bum, bum. And so, thusly ends our look, panel to panel, at X-Men number 56 from 1969. Look, it's all the things that I said, man. It's dated. It's corny. It's cheeseball. It's whatever. But the art is fantastic. I love it. And I just love the looking back at a different time period. It says a lot about what was going on in the culture back then, even if it was a lot of bad B movie shtick. But everywhere, every great thing starts from somewhere. And the X Men as a whole, you know, are still pretty great in my book, even all the way back then. They, they found a way. And adding Neil Adams to the bunch doesn't help its history at all. So anyway, that's X-Men number 56. I hope you guys enjoyed talking about it or listening to me talking about it or watching me talk about it or however you consumed this content. So don't forget to be a subscriber to the channel. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Over and over and over we sell ourselves this spiel. If you like it, come back and check us out some other time. Otherwise, keep reading comics. Be good to each other. And we'll be back with X-Men number 57, the third oldest book in my X-Men collection, pretty soon. Have a good day. See you later, bubs.